thank you so much. I really appreciate your invite and I love to see so many people, you know, joining in to see the talk. Uh, yeah, without further ado, I will begin. Thank you everybody for coming and I will talk a little bit about uh, C++ 7 and 14 at scale, what I've learned over time and a bit of a plug for my latest release book as well, Embracing More C++ Safely, and I'm going to show you some extracts of the book during this talk as well. As Klaus mentioned, I like to keep things interactive. So, you know, I, I'm going to take a look at the chat uh, from time to time. So anytime you have any question or comment, just, you know, chat and I will take a look at it and reply as soon as possible. Cool. So a little bit of backstory about the book and this talk. In 2017, uh, that's sorry, 2016, that's when I joined Bloomberg as a software engineer. It was my first year there and it was great. I met a lot of interesting people. And one of the things I noticed during the training sessions that are mandatory for every new hire was that there was a lot of care into writing very good C++ software, but it was a little bit outdated. Like C++ 11 and 14 were just kind of like mentioned here and there and there was no real let's put it this way, kind of like course that allowed people to migrate from C++ 3 code base to a modern one. So I saw this as an opportunity and the year after I actually developed an in-house 11 and 14 course. I asked permissions to my managers. They were all very supportive of this uh, effort. And I'm still giving that same course, of course, after a lot of improvements uh, to this day. And in fact, I've changed from a software engineer to a technical trainer full time. And most of the things that were Bloomberg nowadays revolve around modern C++ training. 2019, I was at C++ Now, great conference. I really miss Aspen and meeting all the people there. Hopefully this year will go as planned. And I was talking with John, which is my friend and coworker. We actually used to go to the gym together, C++ Now. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we were discussing this course that I created at Bloomberg. He actually attended it and he found it very useful because it's kind of like an old timer. You know, John has a lot of knowledge, but a bit of like mostly C++ 3, but never actually embraced the new standards. So I found it useful and was like, look, this is good information. Why don't we write a book about this stuff? And we kind of started brainstorming and say, okay, there's already some books that cover these topics. What can we do to make it more uh, original, more unique? And the idea of basically uh, analyzing what Bloomberg and other big companies have done with Modus Plus Plus and try to figure out the best way of teaching the features and what hidden pitfalls and potential weird things that are not obvious might happen came out and we decided to do, to do this effort and write a new book. The original plan was to have something concise around 300, 400 pages, and we were kind of convinced it was going to be a very easy task. But as you can see here, we have this huge book. It's around 1400 pages and it's full to the brim with information. We had more than 20 people working on it, uh, including a lot of people from the ISO committees um, and a lot of people that actually created the features we talk about. And it was a joint effort between four quarters of which I am one to basically get this to life and, and you know, capture all this good information. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, but it's, um, it's really packed with very interesting stories and use cases and pitfalls that, I, that you, might, you have not might seen before. So when the idea of the book came out, I spent, let's say, the next three years basically rediscovering 11 and 14. You know, it's very easy to, to say, yeah, I know modern C++, I've used move semantics, I've used variety templates, I've done some crazy stuff with lambdas and stuff like that. But in these three years, I realized how many dark corners and also, you know, nice, good corners that are still hidden are there that a lot of people don't realize. And even talking to people like Alistair Meredith, which is the fourth quarter, or people like Nina Rance, or the people from the ISO committee who actually helped develop these features, we still found we still, we still found a lot of surprises. And these people as well, we were directly involved with the creation of these features, found surprises and interesting things to talk about. So it was a really nice way of rediscovering these new standards from a point of view of somebody that's been working with Sales Plus and with modern Sales Plus for multiple years. So in general, you're going to see this theme that basically, yeah, we could have written a book about 11 and 14 
in 2011 and 2014. But what makes this book unique is that we're looking at the standards with the experience and the eyes of somebody who has used them for multiple years and actually had a chance to verify the impact of these new standards on real large code bases. 2021, last year, we finally released the book. I showed it to you. It's here. You can purchase it. Um, in the US, a lot of people already have got the paperback version. Uh, in uh, the UK and EU, you can purchase the paperback from InformIT. Uh, Amazon will start shipping it in our, about two weeks, but I'm going to talk about this stuff at the end. There's going to be links and whatever. So, what is this talk about? We first, I want to kind of like reassure you that there is a good reason to talk about 11 and 14 in 2021. It's not late. I'm going to show you ways that 11 14 can surprise you today after years of experience. I'm going to talk a little bit about sales plus at scale in general, and then I'm going to start uh, talking about the things that we have inside the book. This idea of the safety of a feature, basically in the book we categorize features by safety levels. And then I'm going to show you an extract from the book, which is a case study on extended threat declarations and how they interact with CRTP, which is an interesting interaction, which uh, is not very common, but it can lead to very good improvements if you use that pattern. OK, so why do we care about 11 and 14 around six, seven years later? What's the point? So these are some results from something that the ICC++.org website does every year, which I find really, really useful. It's basically a survey uh, directed to all C++ developers where they basically ask a lot of questions regarding tooling, standard usage, you know, the kind of field they work in. But one of the questions that is very important is, are you allowed to use these standards at your company or during your hobby projects? And you can see in 2018, the situation was that pretty much 83% of the people had full 11 adoption and around 58% of the people had 14 adoption. Then 2019, things improved. We have 88 and 65. 2020, things improved even more and we have 90% and 74%. And we start seeing good adoption of 17 and a little bit of 20 as well. So with time, you see that people actually start embracing the standards. 2021, which was last year, even a little bit better, 87, 76, the sample size obviously changes, but this seems okay, right? Well, the truth is, even if the results might seem good, if you think about it from the opposite way, you can see that in 2018, about 20% of the people were not using 11. And in 2021, about 25% of, of the people were not using 14. Sample size changed and decreased over time, but again, it's always going to be biased, but it, it gives you an idea of these things. The other part of this is that my personal experience tells me that 11 is still a luxury in some places. For example, in some companies, Bloomberg included, there are some machines that have legacy architectures which run important software which is hard to port and people are forced to maintain them and they might not be able to use 11 and 14 um, or even standard 03 they might use you know the old sales plus 98 and the problem there if you get stuck maintaining these things which are really important for the company you will lose on the knowledge and experience of modern C++. And also if you just go online, particularly on Reddit, you will still see people complaining nowadays about, hey, I wish I could use modern C++, but at my company we cannot do it because of X, Y, and Z. So there still is um, a case to make here that um, unfortunately some people still didn't have exposure to 11 and 14. And now the other thing is like, if you imagine, you know, for example, the results we see in 2018, where um, like half of the people couldn't use 14, once they start using it, they basically have no experience. They are lacking those four years of experience that it could have had by starting using it as soon as possible. So how do we get them up to speed without having them make the same mistakes that the other people made while learning how to apply 14 things in a real code base? In general, you know, I'm going to sound very uh, cliche, but experience is the best teacher. And I've been using C++ as my main language, both for work and hobby projects since 2012. And I've seen and experienced 11 and 14 used in production at Bloomberg uh, in a very in-depth way, especially over the past six years where it started gaining traction and pretty much everybody was started using it. And as I mentioned, I also been teaching 11 and 14 professionally since four years. So I had a lot of visibility and awareness of what these new standards can do to a large company. 
the other thing is that you can find a lot of great learning resources. You know, there, there were great books on 11 and 14 released right in 2011 and 14. But what I've noticed is that these resources mostly teach the features rather than the experience. So they will tell you what the feature is, what the intended usage is, what the syntax is like, how to avoid common mistakes. But since they were released so closely to the actual release of the features, they lack that multi-year experience of, yeah, we noticed that after using this in the real world for multiple years, we noticed that this might not be a good idea or this might not be a good idea. So you don't get that experience. And what looks good on paper, what makes a lot of sense even on a book in isolation, might not have the same impact in the real world. And this is something we're trying to convey with the book uh, that we wrote as well. So how can 11 and 14 surprise you today? In general, I will say that some features can be unpredictable even today. Case in point, I want to ask you a question. What is the smallest change to the core language that you can think of in C++ 11? Any ideas? Like the most inconsequential thing you can think of, but it must be a core language change. I'm going to take a look at the chat. No pointer. Uh, no pointer is pretty small. Uh, there is a bit of library involved, but there's something even smaller. Auto, you know, if you use it properly and if you use it for small things, yes, but it's a huge change in my opinion. Yeah, context per also big change. Override, override is more more along the lines of what I'm thinking of, but there's something even smaller. Memory model, I don't know if I would say that's small. Okay, I'm going to give you a, a hint. Oh, somebody got it. Yeah, Daniel says space between double closing brackets. Yeah, so basically, you know, in C++ 3, whenever you were writing a template instantiation, so for example, a vector of complex of int, at the end, you had to put a space in between the closing angle brackets, otherwise the compiler would tell you, look, why are you trying to bit shift things that should be bit shifted? Like it was forced to interpret the double closing angle bracket as a bit, a bit wise operator. In 11, they made a change, they made the compiler a bit smarter, and they said, look, if it's obviously in a context where we are defining a type, then you know the, the user is just trying to close those angle brackets. Even this small and consequential change um, can have some impacts. For example, it can make a valid C++ 3 ill-formed in 11, or even worse, it can silently change a program's behavior from 03 to 11. Now, I'm not saying that these are things that you're going to encounter in the real world, and I'm trying to show you like the most extreme case, but I think it's an interesting way of showing you where I'm going towards. So this is an example of the first thing. You know, for example, if you have this struct called uh, padded buffer, it takes some power of two integer as a template non-type parameter, and then I initialize it like this. I can say padded buffer 256 uh, right shift four small buffer, and this would have been completely fine in C++ 3. But if you try to compile the same code in 11, it will not work. It will not compile because this changes meaning. So the easy fix here is to basically just wrap the entire uh, right shift expression in parentheses like you see over here, and it will work. So not a big deal, and very unlikely to happen, but still interesting to know about. The second point, which is the silently changing behavior, is not something that I want to spend a lot of time on. It's just, again, showing you the extreme case, like the hyperbole. Like even something as small as a quality of life improvement on the syntax of the language can turn a C++ program into an 11 one, which is valid, but does something completely different. So basically, if you have some sort of expression like this one, when there is a combination of um, you know, scope resolution operators into enums, and some templated structs, you can get into a point where if you have the syntax like this, then in C++ 3, you will do a shift between zero and the global variable C in the global namespace. And in C++ 11, you would actually close the two and then access through the scope resolution operator, the C member of that enum or whatever. So the same program, C++ 3 will return 100, and it says plus 11 will return zero. It takes two different code paths because of syntactical quality of life improvement. Again, just want to make clear, this is not something that will probably happen in practice, but it's just showing you the whole concept that something inconsequential can have, you know, very large ramifications, the butterfly effect. So yeah, what, there are things that we discovered that are actually 
more likely to happen in practice and they can have uh, catastrophic results. So for example, even the use of attributes, which are commonly known as you know, just extra information for static analysis or compilers, can make your code ill-formed and NDR. Like the, your program will be broken if you use the wrong attribute in the wrong place. Uh, external template, a lot of people that know about this feature, which is not really well known, um, often think that external templates main role is improving compilation times and code size, but sometimes it does the opposite. And sometimes it just doesn't do what you expect. Why? We cover this in the book and we have some examples of external template misuse. Even if you use Meyer singletons, you know, static uh, function scope variables to, to avoid synchronization issues while you initialize singletons, you can still get you in, into undefined behavior because of the destruction order of these things, which is not specified. And we have some examples for in, in some situations where, for example, you may have a logger singleton and a file manager singleton, and they try to use each other and it gets really messy. Uh, rostering literals, they are great to embed things like shader code or JSON in your program. But how do they deal with the white space? Does it matter if you're on Windows and Linux, which use different line endings? What about indentation and uh, you know different kind of spaces? Does it matter? And there are cases where this could cause problems. So pretty much what I'm trying to say is that almost every feature, even the safest one, might have a dark side. And these sort of things are not the things that you discover where you're designing the feature or reading a reference about the syntax and the main use case of the feature, but there, these are things you discover with experience. And what we're trying to do is convey that experience in a, con, you know, in a, in a direct way through the book. Okay, what about modern C++ at scale? What changes there? Uh, before I go there, there's, gonna, there's a question in the chat. Are there tools that spot changes in meaning between language versions in our code or maybe compiler warnings? Uh, yes and no, this mostly depends on the change itself. So for example, the one we've seen here with the, with the closing brackets, I think that both GCC and Clang give you warnings, like if you have this code and I suggest adding parentheses if you're using WX or something like that. But other things, for example, uh, the attributes, if your code is ill-formed NDR, it means not diagnostic required. And this is, these are not things that compilers can actually easily catch. And even external template, for example, you don't really see that compilation impact unless you benchmark it yourself. So it depends on the case. There are some warnings and static analysis tools like Clang Modernize, which can help detect some possible things that might not work in modern C++. Another common one that comes to mind is if you have really old code where you have the auto keyword be used as a um, like, like like it was using C to specify this variable has uh, automatic lifetime. Tools will tell you, hey, if you compile this with 11 mode, it changes meaning. But generally speaking, the more subtle ones don't really have warnings and things like that. Okay, so I want to cover a bit about my teaching experience as well. I think it's interesting to see how teaching 11 and 14 changes when you have a very large company. And my problem here was basically figuring out if I have a very, let's say, heterogeneous and varied audience and environment, what is the best way of teaching modern C++ to those people? What features should I prioritize or avoid? And you know, there's a lot of diversity of skill and seniority, and also something that matters a lot is the style of the company. What is the impact of the style guide that the company might impose on, on people? I've taught C++ to people that were as young as 21 years old, maybe even younger, and then as old as 17 year old, even older. So there is a huge age range with different experiences and ways of seeing the world. Uh, I've taught C++ to people with a lot of prior C++ experience, a lot of maybe people with a lot of development experience, but not C++ experience. Some people had experiences with other languages, so they want to do things like they did in Java or in Haskell. Uh, some people were really interested in modern C++. You know, they were like, yeah, this is new. It's cool. I want to learn about it. Some people just don't care. They're like, no, I just want to do my job. You have to convince me that this new shiny thing will make, will help me do my, do my job better. And also some people have a lot of different goals. Some people want to do library development stuff, you know, get into the tricky details of the language. Some people just want to do application stuff. They just want to glue stuff together to achieve a goal that brings value to a company. So all this diversity makes it really hard to design a course for modern C++, which you know, gives everybody the best possible bang for their buck. 
The other thing is that companies like Bloomberg can have thousands of engineers. And not every company is like Google, where we have this like these fancy code governance tools and we can basically detect any misuse of some deprecated API and automatically convert it to the new one and stuff like that. So one of the things that um, that these companies do is have style guides. And style guides are kind of essential to promote consistency and discoverability in large companies because we want people to use the same conventions. And if everybody uses the same conventions, people are going to have an easier time reading each other's code and discovering other tools and whatever is available. But the problem here is who writes the style guide? Like, should we just blindly listen to the person who wrote the style guide? And what is the input to the style guide? Like, okay, let's say I am tasked with writing a style guide. How do I make the decisions, um, for example, to say that some language feature will be banned or that some naming convention will be used? Like, what is my input to make these decisions? And this is something that also we are trying to solve with the book. Like, we're trying to be as objective as possible, just present use cases and pitfalls. And then, you know, somebody working in a safety critical environment might take a look at some features in the book and be like, okay, this is great, but this particular pitfall here might be catastrophic, even if it's very rare. So I'm just going to ban the feature to be safe. Likewise, somebody working in a game dev company might, might think the same thing and say, look, this pitfall might be problematic, but I'm writing games, not airplanes. So the benefit I get from the use cases is larger than the actual pitfall. So that's what we're trying to do, being objective and give people an input to style guides and uh, upper management decisions. One of the ways we try to do this is by providing a level of safety. So what we do is, as I mentioned, try to be objective, but also we kind of, you know, imbue a little bit of our experience by telling people beforehand hey, that a feature might be uh, more risky than another to use because of some attractive nuisances or some sort of pitfalls that are easy to run into. So when we talk about safety, we are, let's say, intentionally using this controversial word. You know, every C++ feature is safe if you use it correctly. But what we're trying to kind of like capture with this safety idea is what is the likelihood that you're going to be using it correctly? Or is there any attractive nuisance to the feature? So is there anything that makes you want to do something that is actually really bad? Uh, what are the advantages of using a, risk, a feature compared to the risks? And is it worth teaching to a new hire, to an experienced hire? Like, would you teach this in a senior class or in a junior class? These kind of things are the things we're trying to capture when we talk about safety. So in the book, this is the definition we give. And we say the degree of safety of a given feature is the relative likelihood that widespread use of that feature will have positive impact and no adverse effect on a large software company's code base. So as you can see here, it's not really an exact science. It relies on teaching and some mutual experience. And it's a useful metric to help people decide what should be taught or what should be be focused on when you are bringing new engineers to speed. And we have three safety levels, safe, conditionally safe, and unsafe. Safe features are the ones that add considerable value, are really easy to use and really hard to misuse. And we say that ubiquitous adoption of such features is productive. Conditionally safe are features that still add considerable value, but they are prone to misuse. So we want people to use this, but they need to know about the potential issues. So there needs to be a little bit more of in-depth training before these are used correctly. And then we have unsafe features. Again, unsafe doesn't mean that they are inherently bad, but they actually just provide value only in the hands of an expert and are prone to misuse. So even if something can, you know, never actually cause a runtime defect, maybe it's just completely inconsequential unless you use it in a proper way. So still, we will make it unsafe because it only provides value if you are very experienced with it and if you know what you're doing. So in general, we wouldn't teach these features as, a, as, a, as part of a general 1114 course, but we might have shorter talks or courses specifically on these features as they would require explicit training on their particular use cases and pitfalls. Okay, example of a safe feature. Override, I think, is the prime example of a safe feature. Somebody mentioned it before. It's a very simple change and it's great. Uh, if you've never seen it before, 
then what you do is basically you can use this override contextual keyword after the parameter list of a function in a derived class who is overriding a virtual function in the base class. And if it is indeed overriding the function, this code will compile. If it is not overriding, for example, you made a typo in the name or in the parameter list, then the code will not compile and it will tell you, hey, you meant to override, but it's actually not overriding. So this feature is great because it prevents bugs. You know, if I make a typo, as I mentioned, the code will not compile. It's great for, for whoever is reading the source code, because if I'm reading the source code and I see override, I know exactly that this is a virtual function and I know exactly that this is overriding something else. And it doesn't really have any technical downside. There is no way you can misuse this. Like if you try to use it in a place where it's not supposed to be used, it will give you a compilation error. Like you cannot really make a mess of out of override. Um, even then, there is one potential pitfalls that we discovered through experience. And this is more of a human pitfall. It's not something related to the feature. But if you imagine everybody in a team using override as much as possible without enforcing it, so without any static analysis that enforces that it's used whenever it should be used, they will start you know, thinking that every time override is there, the function is overriding, and every time it isn't, the function is not overriding. So as soon as somebody forgets to put override on something which is overriding, the compiler will not say anything, and people might inadvertently assume that it is not a virtual function and do something bad. So again, this is a great feature. There really are no technical downsides, but as part of a human experience thing, we strongly recommend that this should be used with enforcement. So we should have some sort of uh, CI pass or something like that that tells you, hey, this overrides, please put override there. Otherwise, people might get confused and might rely on the keyword presence, even if it's uh, incorrect. This one is a bit more interesting, an example of a conditionally safe feature, which is range-based for loops. So they're fantastic. They simplify a lot of code, and I still dread you know, C++ 3 code with iterators and stuff like that that takes six lines just to iterate over a container to print the values out is just terrible. So these are a great tool. But there are problems with uh, range-based for loops, things you have to be aware of. As an example, I want you to take a look at the code on the slide. It was for a game I was working on in, uh, in the past, and the idea was basically that I had this keyboard trigger getters array. is basically an array of std function or something like that. I gave it some bind, which might be the action you perform in the game, and after invoking it, it gives you back um, you know, whatever the user set. For example, if the bind ID is crouch, it will give you back maybe the key C or the keyboard control key to that the user decided to use. And then basically, the user could also set combinations. For example, you want to have a specific action when you press both control and D or something like that. Then we had this combos container over here, which returned a set of all these particular combinations. Then I iterate over the combos, and then I can check, OK, if the combo is being uh, executed right now, then I'm going to perform the action in the game. And my trigger getter looked a bit like this. It has this get combos member function, which is the one we call over here. It's const qualified and gives you back a vector of combos. So I want to ask you, is there any issue in this code? Do you think it is OK or do you think there is a problem? OK, so some people seem to have um, some issues with temporaries and dangling to death. I like that. Uh, somebody mentioned it depends on the return type of call operator. You can imagine the call operator here. Um, actually, I would say it doesn't depend on that. It will give you a trigger getter. It doesn't really matter if it gives you a value or a reference. I don't think it depends on that. Uh, const, const is not an issue, reference. OK, so I see a lot of people worried about the lifetime of this temporary over here. Yeah, because we're getting a temporary. Maybe some people worried about the reference. Uh, the truth is, this code as written is completely fine. And I think Daniela showed the potential expansion of this. Basically, what's going to happen is that you're going to have an auto ref ref range generated for from the race for loop expansion that binds the reference to this expression over here, the one that ends up with get combos. 
But uh, since get combos returns by value, which means that this expression over here is a PR value, the lifetime of the temporary return by get combos is guaranteed to be extended to match the lifetime of the range reference that was generated by the range based for loop. So the lifetime of this thing would be extended for the entire range based for loop, and this code is completely fine. So this is sort of a trick question, maybe, but this code is okay. Even though it's a bit scary because of this temporary, it is guaranteed to work because we're returning by value, and this expression is a PR value. This is, these are the dark corners of lifetime extension in C++. So why am I showing you this? Because I remember that I saw this code over here, and I was like, uh, why are we returning by value? We are basically recomputing the same combo vector over and over. We should cache it and optimize it. So what I did was basically uh, say, OK, pretty much every user just sets the combos once. So I'm going to have a cached combos vector data member inside the trigger getter. And I'm going to set it when I basically create the trigger getter. And then instead of copying it all the time, what I'm going to do is simply return it by a const reference over here and simply return a reference to the data member of the trigger getter. And after I did this, everything seemed fine, but then some stuff in the replace system just broke, which was completely unrelated. I used some sanitizers and I realized that this was actually undefined behavior. And it actually was one of those cases where the undefined behavior starts affecting something which is completely unrelated, which is super annoying. And thank God I use sanitizers without trying to debug it myself. Now, what changed? The only thing that changed is that now, instead of returning a value, we return a const L value reference to the vector. But now, since this expression over here, the get combos one that we use in the rate based for loop is not a PR value expression anymore, then it will not be lifetime extended anymore. So now, when we have the expansion that was mentioned before, the auto ref ref range, equals blah, 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 get combos. Since this expression is not a PR value expression, it is not eligible for lifetime extension. Therefore, this uh, temporary that we get from trigger getter over here is going to die right before we start the loop. And any usage of C inside the body of the loop is undefined behavior. So as you can see, the original code was fine. We thought about the lifetime extension and everything, but then somebody, in this case me, changed the underlying code, didn't realize that this was being used in a range based for loop, and we got in trouble. And this is what I mean by subtle and experience, right? Everybody can tell you, look, don't use temporaries as part of range based for loop. But the story there is more complicated. You know, you can use temporaries if you know what the, what the problem is and how to avoid it, but you also have to be careful about not silently breaking existing range based for loops by doing things like this, because there's really no easy way of detecting it. So these are also some examples of why we have these conditional safe features in the book and why we try to explain these potential pitfalls from the perspective of, you know, this is something that happened and can happen to you if you're not careful. If, if people are not clear on what's happening here under this, the hood, I can show you later um, on Zoom. So I think that would be a nice thing to discuss if you want to see more details about this. In general, like range-based for loops are a great tool, uh, but you need to be aware of the pitfalls. You need a little bit extra training compared to override. So override, you can just you know teach a class of new hires and tell them, yeah, use override, it's good. But range-based for loops, you have to tell them, hey, range-based for loops are good, but here's how they can go wrong, and maybe have an exercise to see if they understand it. And this is why I think they are conditionally safe feature. There was a paper, uh, P20. 12 uh, by Yusudis and Viktor Zevaric and other people. And this paper attempted to solve the issue that we discussed in the previous slide. And to be honest, I think it was a nice fix. It specifically solved this issue, which is the most common problem that people face with lifetime extension because it's very subtle in the range base for loop because of the code generation that we see and blah, blah, blah. However, it was rejected because people wanted to look for a more generic solution that applies to the whole language. Now, I can see their reasoning, but we had a chance to pretty much eradicate one of the most common pitfalls for this feature that especially beginners fall into. And sometimes you have to ask yourself, is perfection the enemy of good? 
right? And the other thing is like, if you're trying to get a language global solution for lifetimes, then you're pretty much re-implementing Rust. So as you can tell, I'm not really happy with the outcome of this thing, but it was rejected and we still have to teach people that it is a conditionally safe feature and I have to be careful with it and people still need to get to know about lifetime extension and all that stuff. So yeah, that's the state of things. Okay, we can discuss about an example later on on Zoom. Uh, I'm going to keep going forward now and I'm going to show you an example of an unsafe feature, decal type auto. So decal type auto is one of those features that has some very important use cases. You know, if you're trying to be as generic as possible and you want to forward something and you don't know what it is, if it's an L value, R value, volatile, const or whatever, then decal type auto is one of the ways you could achieve that and, um, you know, have a truly generic transparent interface. However, I've seen people often misuse it without proper training and care. Some people use it where auto or auto ref, ref would have sufficed, or some people use it thinking that, you know, it avoids copies when it doesn't and stuff like that. Uh, an example where this feature makes sense is something like this, a higher order function. You may have this function called log and call. It takes some callable object F, then maybe you want to do some logging and print out the name of the function or the type, whatever, and then you want to return uh, forward of f uh, call and whatever f forward it returns you want it to be exactly what this function returns so you just want to write a wrapper which is as closely as possible behaving like the original one but also might add some extra features like the logging over here and decal type auto here guarantees that um, whatever f returns be it a reference or object volatile counts whatever will be returned in the same way now this is not the only way you can achieve this but it's a nice way of doing so so one of the mistakes I used to make was teaching decal type auto right after auto and decal type. And my train of thought was, okay, I'm going to provide a complete overview of type inference. I'm going to teach people about auto, then decal type, and then, you know, just combine them and get decal type auto. But the actual results were that um, new hires especially were a bit confused and they saw decal type auto as a more powerful version. And they were thinking of, you know, if decal type auto does what auto can and more, why not always use it? Or maybe if I'm unsure between using auto or auto ref or auto ref ref, why not just use decal type auto? Let the compiler figure it out. And the reasoning might seem right, but when you think about it, it's the same as saying using void star instead of int star when I know I'm pointing to an int. I feel that one good definition for simplicity is using the most limited tool that gets its job done. So not the, mo not the most powerful, but the most limited. So if you can solve your problem by using an int ref, don't use an int star. If you can use, solve your problem using an int star, don't use a void star. You know, just use the thing that is most closely solving your issue without doing more things. And decal type, decal type auto is so flexible that there's really only a few specific places where it's actually you know, the right tool for the job. So in order to understand those places and when not to use it, you need to have a solid grasp on type inference and value categories, which you cannot have if you've just learned about auto and decal type. You need to have some experience with decal type and auto. And since decal type auto is often used in the context of metaprogramming, it also helps to know what Sphina is and, you know, have some metaprogramming experience. Now, I couldn't find pretty much any valid use case for decal type auto in viable position. I think I found one potentially, we can discuss that later on Zoom as well. But to be fair, I've looked a lot, I've asked people, I've asked people from the committee, I've asked on Stack Overflow, even set a bounty on that question. I didn't find anything that was convincing. There are some very specific edge cases where it might be a good idea, but they can also be rewritten without using it. So I'm also asking this to you. If you have a good use case for decal type auto in a variable position, please let me know. I would love to know about it. But I found real use cases as a return type placeholder. So when you have a function and you return decal type auto, then it might be a good idea to do so in generic code. But even those cases must be compared against a train return type where you basically copy paste the whole return expression as part of the train return type. There are subtle differences. For example, the train return type version will be Sphina friendly. The decal type auto one will not. So it is far from trivial. It gets pretty tricky and you don't want people to start playing with this until they get some experience with auto and decal type um, beforehand. Okay, 
So there is a question on slide 37. Thank you for pointing the number out. Uh, to what extent can Decal Type Auto help you avoid grossly non-dry code when writing Sphina friendly generic code? Uh, okay, so I think this is all this is related to what I was saying um, like a few sentences ago. If you need if you need Sphina to take place, so if you have some sort of expression and you want this expression to be Sphina on, you cannot use Decal Type Auto because you lose that Sphina friendliness. You would have to repeat that expression as part of our train return type or as part of your uh, template parameter, you have a dummy default parameter. So in that case, it doesn't help you. However, doing that, you know, repeating the expression makes your code less readable and less maintainable because now you have that extra repetition and it gets more complicated. So I would say in the cases where you need the genericity, but you don't need this Sphina friendliness. So for example, you don't have other overloads. Then Decal Type Auto is the best choice because it makes your code simpler. But in the cases where you also need a Sphina friendliness, then using it would be a mistake because you lose it. So again, there is no real answer. It depends on the context. But to answer your question, it doesn't really help you in those cases because the Sphina friendliness that you get comes from having that expression um, visible as part of the declaration and not as only as part of the body. That's too late because you already instantiated the template. Uh, macros, yeah, you can use macros to avoid the duplication, but at that point you you use macros, which you know I think some people some people demonize them too much. They might be useful, but they can leak. They might be named too long, and you have to kind of like weigh the pros and cons against the repetition. And sometimes the repetition is the least of, of the two evils, you know. So. Again, you have to think about it, but that's that's a good question. OK, um, some more example. Safe, we put attributes, null pointers, static assert, DG separators. Conditionally safe, we put auto, constexpr, are by references. Unsafe, we put this disgusting thing, carries dependency. Final, inline namespace. Final is particularly interesting. We can have a chat about that on Zoom, but we have a good reason to do that. Uh, but in general, as you can see, most features in 11 and 14 are safe or conditionally safe. There's only seven unsafe in 11 and two unsafe in 14. So generally speaking, these standards are quite safe and we can encourage people to use most of what they have to offer. 17, who knows? We're doing research where it's being used at Bloomberg nowadays and we're seeing uh, how people are reacting to the new features and what they think about them. 20 is way too early to speak about it. 20 is also very large, so I expect that research in this area would take multiple years to figure out, you know, all the weird pitfalls of coroutines and how they can bite you and all that stuff. But 17, I'm optimistic that most of it is safe and conditional and safe as well. So how do I use this categorization in my teaching effort? Uh, yeah, safe features. Teach them early and quickly. Trust your students. Most of them are really hard to misuse and people can figure them out. Conditionally safe features are important. Teach them by building on top of safe knowledge, but show how they can backfire. And as I mentioned this before, exercises are great. So one of the things I would do is if I have a range space for loop, I would tell people, hey, think about it. Does this actually cause lifetime problems or not? And have that exercise so they can actually start and figure out for themselves how to know whether they're affected by that issue or not. And for unsafe features like, um, let's say, like for example, inline namespaces, have a short course specifically on that feature, maybe even a talk and be like, library API and API versioning with inline namespaces and show them how it can work, what can go wrong and how to use it. Like there's no need to tell students that are new hires or just wanna get their life a bit easier about this stuff. It's just gonna be confusing and counterproductive. Okay, question on slide 39. Uh, what do you think auto is going to say? safe? We use that a lot in our code base. So first of all, the frequency of using a feature is not really rele relevant to the safety. And again, safety is an interesting term is not about being safe or unsafe. It's mostly like, um, does it give you a net benefit and how hard is it to teach and what can go wrong, what cannot go wrong? Auto is a great feature, but there are a lot of things you have to consider. First of all, the overuse of auto. Like a lot of people tend to overuse auto and even if the code is correct, it just gets harder to read. There is no reason to use auto 
if you're just going to make your code harder to read to save two characters, right? But I've seen people do that. And in general, this is more of an art than a science. You have to look at your context if you know. If the thing that you are ordering is defined two lines above, then fine. But if it's another file, then even, even you know, having a longer type name can actually really help understanding your code. So that's one of the reasons, readability and having that experience to figure out, am I using it in a way that actually makes my code more readable or am I just trying to save a key, few keystrokes and making somebody's life harder in the future? There are issues, for example, Daniela mentioned, um, my create copies, you know, people that come, for example, from um, JavaScript or Java backgrounds, they will write range based for loops as auto X colon, and they expect auto to do the right thing and not copy. But when they write auto instead of const auto ref, they might get a lot of unnecessary copies. So they have to know about the fact that auto copies and even that the most, you know, uh, appetizing way of writing a range based for loop, which is very simple and resembles the var x in C sharp or stuff like that actually uh, creates performance issues. Um, implicit conversions are also potential other issues. You know, maybe some concrete type that looks like it's a concrete type is actually doing a conversion that you replace it with auto and you lose that conversion. So a lot of things to just think about. And in general, I, I teach auto to my new R students very quickly, but I also tell them, look, this is something that can, you know, bite you in the butt after a few months. So be careful with it. These are the things that can go wrong. This is how you can negatively affect readability. So that's the idea there. We, it's not something that we discourage from using. It's something that we encourage using with the right knowledge and the right ideas about what can go wrong. Okay. Any more questions on anything we have seen so far? I like <laughs> that modules are safe because no compilers implements them. Yeah, <laughs> that's a nice way of having safe feature. Um, yeah, comment. I've seen code returning incorrect types when using auto. I think specifically for uh, the deduce return types, we actually put them as unsafe. Like auto variables are less risky than auto return types. First of all, auto return types completely obscure the API of a function and usually don't want to do that. So I remember seeing, I don't want to pick on anybody, but I remember seeing, um, I remember seeing a library posted on Reddit and like on the readme on GitHub, the API was all auto return types and there was no train return type. So I'm just like, how am I supposed to even know what these functions do, right? And they fixed it after some people commented it in a not very nice and friendly way. But the point is like, all the return types, especially decal type auto, but even the auto one and auto ref, they are very rare. Like the reasons why you would use them is when you need a genericity and when, uh, when you cannot specify the return type in a way that's readable. For example, you need to use nested type devs or some sort of some sort of like weird decal type thingy. So in that case, like return types that are deduced are even worse than auto variables. Uh, I think I missed your question. Let me see it. Uh, is it could the get combos be called outside the loop? Is that the one, Honey? Uh, yeah, it could and it would solve the problem. That's 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 a good question, but yeah, we can discuss the snippet later. Do you see auto plus concepts more favorably than just auto alone? Yeah, massively. Like if you are saying something like, I don't know, auto range rather than just auto, then you avoid having to hard code the range type to something that might change, like, you know, vector or list or whatever, but you still give people all the knowledge they need to understand what the code is doing. You are basically saying, look, I don't care what this variable is. What I care about is that this is a range and that it has begin and end. So applying a concept to an auto variable is a much nicer way of getting the genericity, avoiding potentially long and hard coded type names while still retaining the full readability, even better, because you are just saying, I don't want a vector here, I want a range. So you're even telling the users, the readers, that you thought about it and what you need is not a concrete type, but something that represents that concept. So auto plus concept is much, much better than auto and all. 
yeah, so on slide 12, we can take a look at that in the after uh, in the in the chat after the presentation. We can discuss the snippet more in detail. I will go back to that. I will I will show you that. Yeah, I can copy paste it on Godbolt. OK, uh, let's go to the last part of the talk, extended friend declarations. Uh, so this one is going to be a case study on uh, one of the things we have in the book. And I'm going to show you some interactions with CRTP and other interesting tidbits of knowledge. So first of all, extended friend declarations are a feature that was introduced in CSPAS 11. And basically, they allow you to define friend declarations without having to specify class, struct, or union. So prior to 11, whenever you had wanted a friend declaration, you needed something called an elaborated type specifier. And this is the standard these for basically a syntactical element of this form over here, either class or struct or union space identifier. So for example, uh, you could have a struct S in the global namespace, then a struct example, and then inside struct example, you could say friend class S, which would be friend S, and then you could have friend class non-existent, which would be friend some non-existent type. So the problem here is, first of all, uh, it doesn't matter if what you are trying to befriend exists or not. If it doesn't, you are also declaring it at the same time. And for example, here we have a mismatch between struct and class. The compiler doesn't care. Or here, this non-existent type was never mentioned before, but this line of code is still good because we are declaring it at the same time we are befriending it, which is something that you usually don't want to do. And this restriction, other than having this issue over here, also prevents other entities to be designated as friends because it limits friendship only between a declaration of a class structure union, but anything such as a type def or as a template parameter is not eligible for friendship, even though it is conceptually just a type. So for example, if I have a type def, say using window manager equals Unix window manager, and maybe my example struct is a template and it has a type named T, trying to befriend either window manager or T would result in an error because these are also declarations, but you are trying to redeclare things that are not classes, so it just doesn't work. It will give you a compile time error, which is very unfortunate. Okay, another thing is that it's supposed to three, sometimes because of these quirks, you might think that friend is doing something, but it's doing something else. So you might have a struct S in the global namespace, then you might have a class X3 inside the namespace NS, and if you say friend struct S, then you're actually declaring a brand new type called S as part of the NS namespace and befriending it rather than actually referring to S. So just like, really? It's, it's, it's just super annoying. And there is no easy way of getting this befriended unless you have like a, something inside that same namespace. You might say, yeah, it's good. You don't want to befriend things between different namespaces, but if it's an internal namespace, like an impl namespace, then it's just annoying. So in C++11, we basically lift all the aforementioned limitations because we have this new syntax, which just basically specify friend and any type, and that type will be befriended. So it's not a declaration that creates a new type. It looks for an existing one and befriends it. So I can have a friend T, where T is my type name over here in my template. I can have friend S, and this is unambiguously looked by name lookup, and it will find the global S over here. I can have friend S alias, the with unambiguously refer to this alias over here, which is the same as S. I can even say friend decal type of zero, which is equivalent to friend int. Not really useful, but you can do it because you can now befriend any type. If you try to say friend C, and C doesn't exist anywhere in the current scope, or is not uh, visible via name lookup, then this will be a compile time error and it will tell you C doesn't name a type. So we solved all the aforementioned problems. Okay, this seems good, but we categorize this feature as unsafe. Why? So there are two main reasons. Uh, the first one is that it is rarely useful in practice like friend. So if this, if our book, where to cover C++ free features, we will put friend as unsafe. And since this is an extension of friend, you know, it's still going to be unsafe because it's still an extension of friend. Uh, in general, <coughs> if you find yourself using a lot of friendship, then that's a very um, good indication that your design might be a bit flawed. You don't really want friendship in C++ 
except for some very specific cases, for example, you know, a container and its special iterator class that needs to know about the internals and stuff like that. But anything apart from that, it just means maybe you need to refactor your class hierarchy a little bit better and have unit tests that are smaller and connect things for that dependency injection rather than, you know, just hard coding them and stuff like that. The second reason is specific to friend to extended friend declarations. It promotes long distance friendship, which is the worst kind of friendship. So basically to define long distance friendship, we can say this. When a type X befriends a type Y, which lives in a separate component, and by component we mean like a different physical file, you know, it might be in a different header or in a different namespace. So something that lives conceptually outside of the component we are trying to work with. Then you are basically coupling X and Y together. You cannot independently test them anymore because they depend on each other. You have worse compilation time because including X requires the inclusion of Y. They are physically coupled. They will, can create loops if you're not correct. And it just gets very, very annoying to work with this. Yeah, so we don't want that. And the new extended friend declarations promote this because as you can see it's very easy to befriend something that is outside your namespace. You might be a template type or a type def or something in an outside namespace. So it is easier to get to this long distance relationship. That's why it is unsafe. However, we have found some compelling use cases even for this feature. So the primary use of befriending something like a container and its iterator still benefits from using this feature, even if it's a minor, a minor benefit. If you use the C++ technique to basically befriend list iterator into the list struct over here, then again, you can make mistakes. For example, you can have a mismatch between struct and class, or you can make a typo and say list iterator instead of list iterator. This will compile, your code will likely fail to compile somewhere else where you need private access to the iterator, but still it's just annoying. Like you would like the error to be here, not somewhere in the internals of your list or, or something like that. If you use the new feature and you say friends, friend leads iterator, then the compilation error will be immediate and it will tell you, hey, you're trying to befriend something that doesn't exist, so you likely have a problem there. So even for general use cases, this is an uh, in our, in our opinion, an improvement over the original friend feature. But we also noticed that there are some other interesting use cases. For example, you can have a nice way of creating customization points with type aliases and extended friends. The pass key idiom, which is a nice way of having like fine grained friendship and it benefits from this feature. And also CRTP, which is what we're going to take a look at in the rest of this talk. So if you're not familiar with CRTP, CRTP is an acronym. It stands for Curiously Recurring Template Pattern. And it's basically this. It's when you have a class called base or something like that that represents the base class. It is a template class. It takes on type name T. And then when you derive from it, you say class derived colon base of derived. So what you are doing is you are telling the base class you're deriving from that derived is the type that is being uh, deriving from it. So you are informing a base class of who is deriving it. Um, why is this useful? Because now inside base, you can basically have access to derived and you can implement mix-ins or factor out copy-pasted code, basically have this sort of like compile time polymorphism that doesn't actually result in uh, having to use virtual and has full access to the derived type itself. If you've never seen this pattern, is very useful, so you can take a look at it. Um, you, you can find a lot of articles online about it. Uh, question, what is the passkey idiom? Uh, it's complicated. We discuss it in the book. It, you can also find it online, of course. The idea is that you would have some sort of empty special struct that you can only construct from certain uh, other classes. So you have the friendship there. You can only construct this stuff from another class, and you can use it in the interface of some other functions as kind of like a, a pass key to basically say you can only call this function if you had the permission to construct this object and you can limit that permission to specific classes so you have very fine grained level of friendship. Rather than befriending the whole class, you can befriend a single function or a, a few functions and stuff like that. So it's a way of doing that sort of like fine grained friendship. But there is, it's a bit involved, so I would recommend you to look at some resources on it. Okay, going back to CRTP, here's a use case that we might use CRTP for. Let's say we are running some tests and we want to make sure that some instances of a particular type 
are created and destroyed in the amount of times we expect. So for the class A, we might have a static integer S count, which is our declaration of the counter. And then, excuse me, we're gonna increment this counter on construction, copy and move. And we are gonna uh, decrement this counter on destruction of A. And now in the CPP file, we provide a definition over here just to initialize this counter. It should probably be initialized to zero, but you know, slide where. And now in our test, we can create some instances, make sure that the counter represents what we expect, and that's all good and dandy. However, we find ourselves doing this for A, B, C, D, and E, and so on. So we would actually like to factor out this whole counter mechanism in a way that doesn't have to be repeated and that can be reused for multiple types. One of the ways we could do that is by creating this instance counter uh, class, which is templated on T. And then we are going to provide a protected counter over here. And then we are going to have a public interface to retrieve the counter. And the idea is that the class can mutate the counter because it's going to derive from it as it's going to be protected, but no one else can mutate it. They can just look at the counter through the public interface. And the other cool thing about this is that we don't have to define the counter uh, integer variable in the CPP file anymore. This is in line because it's a variable of a template class. So we can put it in the same header file and we also save some repetition there. So that's what we have. Simple uh, factored out base class. And now we can have, you know, a struct A derives from it, struct B derives from it, and this code compiles and seems to work. Can you spot any issue with this code? Would you be happy if you saw it in a code review? Yes, exactly. So Laguna got it. Basically, if you look carefully, struct B over here derived from instant counter of A. So there is a typo. The compiler doesn't care and you will use the same counter. S count and S count will be shared, will be basically the same one, so you get wrong results. And you might be thinking, oh, maybe there's something wrong with my test with B, but actually you just made a typo over here. So these are the kind of things that we would like to catch a compile time because they're just time consuming and silly. Even another example is a bit more, you know, along the edge of what could happen, but you know, somebody who is not A might derive from A and then change the counter of A because Hiram's law. You know, they might be trying to do something with the counter. Maybe they didn't think that it would share the same counter. Maybe they thought that, that the right class would have its own counter. So that's not good. We would also like to prevent these kind of things. So how do we prevent mistakes like typos and hijacking of the counters from upper derived classes down the class hierarchy? And it turns out that extended for declarations solve both issues in a very nice way. So if we slightly change uh, the definition of our counter to this, by having the count now being private, not protected anymore, and then befriending T, who is the derived class of the CRTP pattern, then this guarantees that T and only T can mutate the counter. So any attempt of mutating the counter from the wrong class, for example, from B over here, will result in an error because it will be private for B. If we specify A here, which is the wrong one, then B will not be able to mutate it. So we get that additional compile time safety because of this more fine-grained friendship. And even in the other case, if you have something that derives from A, then even though they would use the same counter, the derived class AA is prohibited from mutating it because it is not A. So we get the specific coupling between T and the counter and no one else can take a look at it, which is very good for compile time safety. So yeah, it's a simple example, but we have some other examples in the book of where this pattern with CRTP actually helps a lot avoid these issues. And, you know, avoiding things at compile time compared to having runtime defects is always beneficial. And it's it's a nice, you know, uncommon use of extended thread declarations that I've never seen before doing my research, which works really well with the CRTP pattern. However, you know, remember, friend declarations can promote bad design. You can have physical coupling, long distance friendships. But even though they might seem limited to user first, they have some nice properties like the ones we've seen here with the CRTP and also the more basic use cases that just avoid types, typos and mistakes in general uses. However, again, they have a niche nature 
you need to know what you're doing. You need to know why friendship is a bad idea in general. So this is why we mark them as unsafe. You need training and experience to avoid misuse. So you might have a short course specifically on friendship and extended friend declarations rather than presenting this in a, you know, hey, let's teach new hires about modern C++. That would be a bad idea. OK, that's pretty much it. So in terms of conclusion, I would probably say even nowadays, C++ 11 and 14, especially at scale, are an open research area. We still find interesting things and, and, and consequences that we didn't really think about when using these features at smaller scales or when designing them. And more specifically, the human cost of a feature, for example, what I mentioned when I was talking about overwrite, just the idea that people might rely on something without uh, you know, having them enforced and stuff like that, it's not really easy to quantify. You cannot really say, oh, because of this, we spent 10 more hours working on the project or not. So it's something that is not a science, it's more of an art, and we are trying to capture that in, in the book. Categorizing features by safety helps with devising learning paths. So if you want to be as efficient as possible in teaching your employees or in mentoring others, you need to understand what to prioritize. And getting that, you know, kind of like safety uh, categorization helps you build up, you know, this pyramid of, yeah, we can start with the safe stuff, then we can build with the un un unconditionally safe stuff, and then we can have the more unsafe stuff at the top. And, you know, we're going to prioritize the base of the pyramid rather than at the top of the pyramid. <laughs> And in general, all features have good use cases and nasty pitfalls. You know, a hammer is a great tool to, you know, put nails in the wall, but it's probably not a great tool to pet a cat, right? You need to know how to use the hammer, what is it good for, and how it can go wrong. So that is why knowledge is power, again, a bit cliche, but especially for the unsafe things, you need to know, hey, these have very specific and narrow use cases. You need to know what they are and how to avoid the problems there. All of this uh, is available in the book, Embracing More Safe Safely. It is being a very large effort. The main authors were uh, me, John Lakos, Russell Klenikov, and Alistair Meredith, but a lot of other people helped out Joshua Byrne, Andrew Alex Randescu, uh, Pablo Harpen, Nina Rands, Harold Bott, and all the people that you might have heard of, you know, in the standard committee, for example, Sean Parent or Stephen Dewhurst, Iman Rosen, a lot of people that actually contributed to the evolution of Civil Space itself. Uh, it is now released. You can purchase it on emcpps.com. There are a few links. Amazon should be um, should have it already for the US. For Europe, you can purchase it from InformIT or other places, or you can wait a few weeks. Uh, we will be on Amazon as well. And, you know, let me know what you think. If you purchase it, always happy to get some feedback, positive or negative, as long as it's constructive. Super happy to improve the next edition and the next printing of the book. That's pretty much it. And I also mentioned I work on games in my spare time. So shameless plug for a game I recently released on Steam and HIO, Open Hexagon. It's kind of like a spiritual successor to Super Hexagon if you play that game. Sort of arcade vibe, very hard, frustrates you, but addicting. And it's open source in Salesforce 17. You can purchase it on Steam, but it's also free to compile from sources on GitHub. So if you're interested in seeing you know, a full-fledged game uh, how it is designed and how the source code is and how it integrates with other systems. You can also find the source code for free online. And that's it. This is the table of contents of the book. If you're interested in asking, why is this unsafe? Are you crazy? Or why is this safe? It should be unsafe. Then maybe this can give you a little bit of ideas on what to discuss later on. And I'm done. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'll be on the Zoom for a bit before dinner, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. All right, thank you very much. This was a great talk. So now, if you have any final questions that we can answer here, then please post them into the chat. we we'll wait for a couple of seconds. But then else, indeed, there is the great opportunity to join us in the after talk chat. Right. So obviously, people enjoyed the talk. Good to hear that. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Okay, then I would say let's join the Zoom chat. I just posted a link. 
um, please feel free to join. And um, yeah, Vittorio uh, and me, we will just be there in, in a couple of seconds. Yep, okay, sounds good. Great rest of the evening. Or um, we'll see each other in just a few seconds. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I'll catch you on Zoom. If you're not there, it was a pleasure. And hopefully, I'll meet you or see you around at conferences. Cheers.